Nexus PMG welcomes you to the Bigger Than Us podcast, which we as energy geeks lovingly refer to as the BTU. Bigger Than Us is a podcast that focuses on ideas that will shape the future of our planet and ultimately our existence. We will occasionally lean into energy topics because after all, it's the key to our collective survival, but we'll also explore other ideas and topics that we believe will have an impact that is bigger than us. And now, on to today's show. Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Sunny Sanwar to the show. Sunny Sanwar is an engineer and entrepreneur who lived through Clean Tech 1.0 and is building the rails on which climate tech can thrive. He was formerly co founder and CTO at Verd to Go, an energy storage startup. Currently, he is founder and CEO of Dynamics Inc., an intelligence platform for climate action planning for organizations. Sunny holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, a master's degree in public policy, and a PhD based on the clean economy, and was on the Forbes 30 under 30 list in 2019. Sunny, how are you doing today? Doing well, Raj. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Sunny, thank you for joining. Before we dig into dynamics, I want to ask a personal question. How do you graduate four years of high school in eight months? Yeah, so interesting. So, you know, a little bit of background. I, um, so I, you know, I'm originally from Bangladesh, born and raised for the most part. Um, so when we first came to the U.S., um, you know, the education systems are a little different, and they did an assessment test to figure out if I should go in the ninth grade or the 10th grade because of, you know, my age, I was 15. And uh, based on the credits and the school district I was in, they placed me in um, the 12th grade because I had like three years of calculus and like two years of physics. So they had to put me in the 12th grade. Uh, and that's, you know, there was an article at some point that said, you know, uh, in September when I first, you know, walked into school, I was in the ninth grade. And then by May, <laughs> I graduated high school, uh, you know, the following year. So that's what you're seeing in terms of going through ninth you know, from 9th to 12th in just a matter of nine months. But I think you're being a little humble, which I appreciate. But then I'm reading the Wikipedia article. Then it goes on to say that you were teaching college at the age of 18. Yeah. uh, Yeah. So that that came about. So again, I graduated, you know, at 16 from undergrad and I graduated from college, you know, in three years instead of four. Um, And as a senior, I actually uh, accepted a position to teach uh, AC and DC circuits back in Bangladesh and uh, North South University, the computer science and electrical engineering department within uh, North South University. And um, so, yeah, I, I was I was almost 19 when I joined as a faculty teaching a few undergraduate courses. Yeah. So that. Rings back memories. So yeah, that's kind of, it's all linked, you know, like you graduate high school a little early, you get to finish college a little early, and then the next thing is you get to kind of do something a little earlier than you probably would have done later in life. So uh, that's the background. That's the, that's, the, uh, that's the history. And not to embarrass you any further, but at the end of the article, it also says a list of child prodigies. How does that make you feel? I mean, you know, as, as I guess as a child, it's kind of cool. As an adult, it's kind of interesting to know that, you know, the child version of you will remain a little bit more uh, front and center than the adult version. But I mean, it, you know, it feels nice, I guess, being recognized early on, but it's semi also pressure, right? Like as an adulthood, what have you done? It's cool that you've been <laughs> able to do stuff as a child, but, you know, um, so I mean, I think it's a, overall a good feeling, it's slightly embarrassing. And, you know, um, slightly interesting now that I have a child of my own, you know, would I want my child to go through a similar process? And, you know, maybe not in certain ways, right? Like maybe I, I do want her to kind of have a normal, like not normal, but like a more, you know, what the average 18-year-old goes through or an average 16-year-old goes through. I think I might go through it myself. I might want my child to have, you know, something maybe a little different than what I had. So it's it's an interesting feeling for sure. Well, apparently you're no slacker as an adult either. Another part of my research pulled up Forbes 30 under 30 in 2019, and now the CEO of Dynamics. So apparently it's still in your blood. 
Hopefully, yeah. No, that was a really good um, sort of experience I had uh, with my earlier venture called, called Vertigo, for which I got on the uh, 2019 list. And yeah, so that you know, kind of all kind of connects from the, the circuit course that I talked about that I taught at 18. You know, th- those were the times where energy storage was becoming uh, a very interesting sort of space. There's an emerging space, late 08, early 09. And I knew that battery management systems was going to be, you know, the brains behind charging, discharging was going to be the next big thing, you know, compilers, debuggers for energy. And at Vertigo, what we did was we sort of autonomized how a certain battery system should charge and discharge. So we would kind of teach it, hey, in this uh, equipment, the load profile follows this type of a kind of graph, right? At 2 p.m., there's going to be a lot of consumption, so charge up before then. So we would train uh, a battery and the charge control system to do that for each uh, industrial application. And uh, and again, now it's kind of common knowledge. You have a lot of uh, energy storage companies. They're, they're trying out different battery chemistries. But our main approach was, okay, well, given the battery chemistry and given an, an application, how best can we have this provide value behind the meter? And and so so I sold that in 2016 to to a to a manufacturer who integrated the basic you know the firmware and the architecture to their uh, commercial products. So that was a, that was a learning experience really you know like coming from a purely technical background, knowing nothing about commercializing technology or even knowing how a, a technology fits into like a product. Uh, that was a eye-opening moment and as, as you mentioned couldn't have, couldn't stop you know since i started dynamics in 2018 i've taken some learnings from vertigo and you know onward and upward so speaking of dynamics and onward and upward can you give the audience an overview of dynamics and your role at the organization yeah happy to you know i'm chief, chief executive at dynamics and the founder responded end of 2018 and Dynamics is really an interactive uh, platform for you to set and meet your net zero or emission reductions target. So we help enterprises like h H&R Block and others who have you know, assets all over America to really understand what their baseline scope one, two, and three emissions are. And then more importantly, what can they do within the next 24 to 48 months to verifiably reduce it towards some sort of science-based target? So we do it at the asset level. We take a corporate goal and we kind of break it down at the asset level and then figure out, given the asset, what types of interventions would best help them be low carbon. So we help enterprises like HR Block. We help utilities like Duke and others. We also help city governments set community-wide climate action plans kind of through this underlying product that we're calling decarbonization as a service. We believe that it shouldn't be so hard to do the right thing for climate, and uh, our company is providing the technology to make it simpler for people to just do the right thing. So let's break down three things that you said there. First of all, what is an interactive platform, or how is it an interactive platform? Yeah, absolutely. So interactive. So think about you know traditionally, you know, like when I when I first came to the U.S., we would still see a lot of people kind of traveling, kind of going on road trips with a map, right? Like these giant pamphlets and books where you would manually kind of look at, okay, where am I at? and figure it out and try to take the right exit, try to get there on time, make sure there's no construction. So dynamic platform for for us, an interactive platform for us, means that once you set a goal, like a destination for where your operations ought to be as a company or as a just broader organization or, um, or even a government, we want you to interact with all the pathways that can help you get there. So we, you can almost see like different destination. Hey, this one is two minutes faster, this is eight minutes slower, don't go here, there's a, you know, an accident or something, and it's going to slow down your progress. We want everybody, users of Dynamics, to be able to interactively see these roadmaps. So if you, if you want to be, let's say, 23rd, by 2030, you want to be 80% less emitting than you are today. Well, what, that doesn't mean much at the broader kind of corporate level, right? It could come from half of your electric fleet being electric, it could come from all your energy being wind, it could come from all your waste being off. I mean, there's so many different permutations on how you can meet that 2030 target. 
Uh, so when we say interactive, we want the decision maker to visualize where the emissions coming from, almost like a map, and then understand the kind of different pathways so they could rank order and prioritize based on uh, what they want to do, what is cost effective, what is feasible, and then you know set a climate action target that they can evaluate next quarter, next year. Um, you know, so so that's what we mean by interactive platform for climate action planning. And you mentioned assets, and you mentioned H and R block. So buildings, vehicles. Can you expand on what assets are? Yeah. So assets typically are you know anything that consumes resources and as a result have a emissions footprint. So the, the typical way of looking at, you know, at the macro level, we have, you know, buildings and, you know, residential and commercial buildings more broadly. We have industrial facilities and factories. We have different forms of transportation from flights to passenger vehicles to, you know, ships and, and other things. Um, so, so these four, you know, classes almost, you know, like kind of groupings represent majority of the emission sources that most governments or companies track. So uh, at COP, you know, a lot of countries are looking at it from that same level of breakdown. They would break down the entire economy into those four uh, primary sectors. If you're a corporation, like let's say H&R Block, you know, you're mostly in commercial buildings and maybe some transportation, right? So most of your leased and owned assets, your corporate HQ, your, your branches, franchisees, those are all commercial buildings uh, and, and it's grouped by that. And then you might have some fleet vehicles, you might have um, company cars, you know, stuff that you own or, or lease. And then you have, you know, maybe employee commuting, which is assets owned by your employees, but not directly by the company. And then you have travel, which is flights that you obviously use third party, uh, unless it's like a private jet or something like that. So that is what asset means. So we can kind of break down a country or a city even to these atomic assets, every home, every building, every factory, every vehicle, every flight or every plane. Uh, and then we do it over time, right? So each year we can break down an entire region's emissions to the assets. And then at the asset level, we get to say, what if we do what if scenarios? So for a building, hey, electrify your heating, and then decarbonize the power that you use, right? That's Those are the two major levers you can pull at a home. But, you know, you can't do that at, you know, with a car. You can't say my car is 100% clean energy because it's, it's gasoline. Even if it's electric, it's whatever you charge it with. So depending on the asset, home, office, car, your pathways are fairly different. Um, and, and so that's why it's important to not just speak from a sectoral perspective, which is helpful because you're aggregating things, but all decisions actually happen down at the asset level. So it's important to have both that micro and macro framework talk to each other. So that's broadly what we mean by asset. And you mentioned scope one, two, and three emissions. Can you share what those are? Yeah, absolutely. So scope one is typically stuff you control. So anything that you burn in your equipment, like mobile combustion or stationary kind of combustion, like natural gas generator at your location, that's scope one. You emit and you control the equipment that emits or the asset that emits, and you have some sort of control on the fuel or resource that is, is used to uh, transform. So that's scope one. Scope two is are things that you might have the equipment that you own, but the actual source of the primary fuel comes from someone else. So electric utilities are a great example. If you're a homeowner, your electricity consumption is actually a scope two since you're purchasing power from your utility company who's maybe buying it from someone else or who's burning their own generation. And then scope three typically is a catch-all for things that are more downstream or fairly upstream that you don't have a whole lot of visibility or control in, or even just a catch-all of other things that you hadn't considered in scope one and scope two. So for you know companies, it's like I said, employee commuting, business travel, waste, um, in the case of a lot, a lot of companies, it's actually your downstream emissions. It is the emissions of your products and services that your customers use. So for utility companies, all of their customers' overall emissions, in, in certain cases, can be classified as a utility company scope three. The same way for a bank, financed emissions 
or debt that they give out to other uh, entities or even residential mortgages of homes could be a bank's scope three emissions because they're financing um, and their customers that have taken up their products are using it to um, do activities that ultimately emit, right? So, so it's, a, it's a web, really. It's a web, you know, someone's scope one is someone's scope three, someone's scope two and someone else's scope one. And, and it's, it seems complicated, you know, as an accounting problem, but from a technical perspective, there's also a lot of synergy because one intervention could potentially help out two different entities if it's linked the right way. So if a utility does something on the grid side, typically a utility customer benefits because their their power just got cleaner without them having to invest in a rooftop solar or something like that, right? So so that's scope one, two, and three is just the uh, classification of how you look at emissions and and then how you sort of understand what levers to maybe pull to reduce emissions. Well, to your point about it being linked, I think it'd be fascinating to see it visualized. Absolutely. And that's, you know, going back to the interactive platform, and that's that's the goal. We want to show that um, there's a lot, like, like I said, a lot of permutations for the roadmap on how you get to your goals, but it, it's not all you. Sometimes, for, for better or for worse, there are others who could help or hinder uh, your journey uh, and and with you know things happening at COP or you know just overall climate um, action becoming a very pervasive topic. Hopefully, the barriers that exist are easy to visualize and remove. And then you know collaboration with folks that could help you out can happen at a faster scale. So your utility could be working with you more directly on cleaning the grid. Um, they could also be helping deploy EV stations in places where there's the most need. Auto companies can, you know, do better on miles per gallon rating for every vehicle or the proportion of their sales coming from EV. So there's a lot of synergy that we can have. It's just linking it all together so that we can visualize this complex web in a more simple way. Now, going back to assets for a moment, how do you gather the data on the assets of your clients? Yeah, so that's so we did, you know, almost like a two-year exercise and then you know we're serving right now the u.s market only so we went through um all 3200 counties tax lot we automated we made a master database basically to classify each property each physical property within u.s soil as one of those three kind of emission standards right the residential commercial industrial transportation um of course there's like power and oil and gas you know, type stuff, but we've classified every asset as one of those things. And then we linked it back to how the U.S. as a nation thinks about its sectoral emissions. And then we've obviously broken it down by who owns or leases or uses those assets. So in residential, more, residential, you know, homes, we know which ones are residential homes, you know, single family homes, multifamily homes, owners and tenants, fairly simple. Um, and, and we kind of create bottom-up models on, on what their emissions are given their occupancy, climate zone, you know, location, et cetera. And then on commercial industrial, we actually know who is the owner of, the, of these assets and, uh, you know, what are they reporting for their scope one, two, and three. So if a company has, you know, 700 buildings across 30 states and it has disclosed a scope two emission of like, you know, half a million tons, you can mathematically, you know, accounting for error, you can mathematically ascribe those 700 assets and the contribution each of them are making to that scope two emission. So we ran this um, giant model for every asset on one end and then uh, every publicly traded company uh, on the other. And then using that, we created this order of magnitude model that, hey, you should do this in this community because you're 8% of their emissions. Or, hey, you know, the utility here uh, is emitting, you know, less today than they were last year. And let's extend out the trend to see what it would be in 2025 and then report that to the city. Hey, the city doing nothing. You know, the grid's getting cleaner. So as the grid gets cleaner, maybe you can work on electrification of end use or electrification of industry or transportation. You know, you could, you know, you could kind of um, divide and conquer on your climate roadmap once you have these asset level um, data points. 
So let's talk about climate roadmaps for a minute. Are you seeing more interest from companies right now or cities and local governments? Um, I think we're seeing interest in two different ways. I think, yeah, I think we're seeing heightened interest. I mean, you can argue which one is more or less, but I think we're seeing it for two different reasons. One, you know, I'll start with the enterprise one first. I think one is the um, the focus on sort of reputational harm more so than a conversation on facilities or operational data, which is the case for cities. Cities want more, you know, better operational data so they can make long-term planning decisions. You know, they're looking at climate risk models to figure out if they could, if, if their revenue sources, which are property taxes, is going to take a hit, have the city or half the commercial districts underwater in the next five to 10 years. So while cities are looking at road mapping more of as a planning exercise, we've seen a lot of corporations look at it more from a, hey, do we have, are we going to have an, a, a bad kind of, of reputational view because we are, you know, two standard deviations higher on emissions per unit revenue than three of our closest competitors. That's a problem. And and we want to know our emissions, but we want to have that added context to know, is this good or bad? Is this too bad? Is this, was this bad last year, but now it's good? You know, they want it to be a little bit more nuanced when it comes to how they're perceived. And um, we saw that with the recent, you know, open SEC letter on what climate disclosures ought to look like. So that's on everyone's mind, right? Like, is, is this, um, are we, am I going to be expected to share these types of data and formats that, that people uh, understand and can compare us to? And if that's the case, which it's looking more and more like it will happen in some way, shape or form, what do I have to do to be proactive? How can I get in front of uh, this transition and, and really understand um, what my data liabilities or environmental liabilities might be, right? So, so that's something we're definitely seeing on the enterprise side. Now, earlier you mentioned you ingested the data of, I think you said, 3,200 counties. You classified all the different properties. Um, unlike some residential, which can be you know, very cookie cutter, commercial buildings are very unique, one-off. How do you know which buildings are perhaps like LEED certified, which ones are more efficient, what the utility profile looks like, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. So for commercial, you know, we do the way, like, like we, you know, we're overall like from a philosophical standpoint we within the team we love to not reinvent the wheel unless we absolutely have to so for certain things we built things that was absolutely needed on others we relied on sort of tangential industry standards so we really took a look at uh, assessment in proper property tax methodologies and also commercial real estate on how things are zoned and how they're occupied and how they um, act so th- so in the land use code there's an activity code based on what is happening. So you can have a residential home that serves food, for instance. It kind of acts as a food sales kind of commercial entity. You can have a university, which is which typically would be classified as, as education, but it's like a lab. So it's almost like almost industrial. So we have to grapple with different competing classifications. And depending on if you're using it for ownership, we would look at you know, the ownership tag versus if it's used for for modeling, like the energy consumption, at which point, you know, we would use what would fit the operational characteristics of a building. So we've come across like mixed use properties, you know, it's uh, the, the first two floors are commercial, and by commercial, half is, is food, the other half is like bank office, and then the top three are residential apartments. So there's obviously a lot of those types of uh, buildings that exist where you have to kind of grapple with competing models on how how to you know classify it, but like what level of factors to attribute. Um, so so for those we do have um, special models where we prorate by square footage, um, and as co- as when it comes to ownership, you know it is business parks and others. We do have a one to many relationship, one building to many company. And we would prorate it as well if company A is like 25% of the square foot and company B is you know 50 and 25 and so on. We would break down the building model down to those constituent sort of company profiles, which is, you know, which is an added step of complexity, but it's also kind of going back to that synergy comment. Um, at the building level, if you change a boiler, 
technically, I mean, theoretically, five different tenants could benefit from that scope two emission reductions, right? If you if you do some sort of a, if you do like, you know, LED lighting or a retrofit or retro commissioning of a commercial building, you know, you're doing it at the building level. You're taking a one-time risk on the investment and, you know, kind of savings over time. But each one of those companies that are headquartered there or whatever, you know, have operations there, they could claim that reduction prorated on their scope two emissions outlook. So, so I think there's still, you know, there's obviously still challenges and complexities on, on what we do, but the hope is that with technology addressing these challenges, we can make it simpler for folks wanting to reduce their emissions to synergize across, across their peers or across other entities that might share similarities and maybe even the building owner knowing that there are five tenants in their building, um, all with ESG and net zero targets could prioritize that retro commissioning project a little bit better, right? So, um, so but it's, a, it's a really good point. I think we're going to be with prop tech and, you know, all these, you know, uh, newer emerging spaces. There'll be a lot more data, a lot more best practices, a lot more interoperability for us to, you know, really solve this problem at scale. So speaking of solving problems, what inspired you, motivated you to start Dynamics? So two, I think, yeah, so I was actually thinking about it like uh, over the pandemic because that's the best time to think about things. <laughs> and, uh, and, a bit, right? uh, and a bit, yeah, exactly. So thinking about things at 3 a.m. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about kind of what what were the contributing factors that led me to like take, uh, take this head on. Um, so one of them was my last company, Dynamics, you know, where we were, you know, our proposal generation actually looked at, you know, building level profiles. Um, so we would look, you know, we would kind of know which buildings in any given market probably had a lot of peaks. We would know the demand charges, we would know overall kind of rate structure. Um, and it was a very long manual process. We would figure out, okay, how many what, how many buildings there might be here, um, which one of them could we kind of scope out kind of um, a proposal for, and, you know, how could we look at, uh, putting together you know, the uh, demand charge reduction on, on the batteries, but also maybe on-site or rooftop solar. Do we do efficiency first, then do we do the other? So I was doing it on a fairly you know daily basis. And I being having you know some technical background, I hate doing things manually when I know you could automate processes. So we wrote um, a script in Python where we would standardize all the building data, and then we would manually loop through it and run a energy storage only model, energy storage plus solar model, energy storage plus solar plus energy efficiency model. So we would do this so that all the outputs were things we could just layer on the proposals. So I did that. So that was part of it. I mean, it was a necessary yet not sufficient condition for starting your own business. So that happened. And then I actually spent a year as a data scientist in local government. So I was at Jackson County in the abatement an assessment office. So we would run models on property taxes based on, you know, permit data, MLS sales comps, overall kind of market conditions, school districts, all that. And when I was doing that, you know, I had the understanding, very kind of in-depth understanding of the standardization of American real estate. So combining what I did Vertigo for energy projects to how regions overall look at economic activity, I was like, well, if the U.S. needs to meet any sort of net zero target, the quickest thing to do is not manually kind of go to these meetings and kind of talk about rhetorical stuff. It, it would be to do a bottom-up sort of looped estimate on how many solutions could we fit in how many buildings and in what order. So those two things together really, and you know, I've been waiting for something like Dynamics myself and after waiting three years, you're like, you know what? Well, it's not going to come come out on its own. Maybe I should start it myself. And um, that's what drove us to productize this process, a process that everyone has to do but hates. Um, how could we do that with a better user experience, you know, at scale? So it doesn't matter if you're in you know, Louisiana or Juneau, Alaska. Your climate journey could be significantly made better by service like dynamics so that's what those two things got me to really think about it this way but you know as well as anyone how difficult it is to start a company and i see the commercial opportunities there 
But what about the why? Why why did this particular area look attractive to you? What about it? What about climate change perhaps drives you? Yeah. I th- yeah, so kind of going back, you know, I was born in Bangladesh. I grew up in Dhaka, which is the capital. And uh, 1998, we had uh, one of the biggest floods, 67% of the country. The country was underwater. Um, and I remember that was right after summer vacation. And when it first started, I was able to, I was kind of happy that we didn't have to go back to school because it was like August or September. But then, you know, really quickly, it was extremely scary, especially to an eight-year-old. Um, and, you know, it was kind of, you know, it's the late 90s. So you obviously like saw on TV that it was kind of concentrated only with us. And I had cousins like in the U.S. and they visited and I, I knew that it was only a Bangladesh thing. You know, the world wasn't underwater. It was just mostly us. So that got me to thinking sort of subconsciously, like, well, this kind of sucks, right? Like, I mean, it's a pretty horrific um, thing that happens. And uh, what is causing it? How can we make sure this doesn't happen next year when I'm nine years old? Or, you know, you start thinking like a kid about some of these things. And that subconsciously really drove me to think about solutions to to climate. So, you know, I think starting a business, you have to be driven by the commercial upside. But as an entrepreneur, sometimes it's what would you rather be doing, right? So from uh, the climate perspective, growing up, I think this whole nagging, I, I rather, I rather work 60 hour a week trying to figure out how we could solve climate like that really invigorates me rather than kind of optimize hey what's the max i can earn for a 40-hour week so i I always had that in the back of my head starting you know um, vertigo early on you know i was 22 i could have taken two job offers that were fairly lucrative for a 22 year old but i ended up you know starting something and you know a lot of people uh, were like well i don't know if you need to do this but that was interesting i'd rather spend my time creating something that i have a very strong conviction for and there's a feedback loop of i'm getting closer you know um than just doing the next best thing and uh, with dynamics that was the same thing you know the upsides were were are, are obviously massive especially now like a year after we started this company you know we started getting more and more people setting net zero targets and then the, the feds moved and now the world hopefully moves. So things are getting better. But the reason why we, why I personally started is I really couldn't see myself doing anything other than trying to solve for the root cause of that flood back in 98. Well, speaking of the world moving, right now as we speak, COP26 is going on. Mm-hmm. What are some of your views as to some of the conversations that have been going on for the past 10 days? Yeah, I mean, I think... I understand why, but some things that, you know, for me, who kind of my personality is like, let's kind of go out and do it kind of a uh, personality. For me, a lot of it has been stating and restating the problem without actually, you know, kind of looking and rancording solutions. So a lot of the sessions that I've joined and and, and kind of um, done, I mean, there's obviously a lot of insightful things people are saying, but a lot of it has been re-problematizing the issue and you know if we had one week to solve something we're already on thursday and we haven't gotten to solutions yet we've spent four three and a half days talking about the problem so a lot of it has been sort of helpful for people to be brought up to speed but if the goal was to really commit and have mechanisms to enforce commitments um i think i think there could have been a lot more done uh, around that i mean understanding that bilateral you know kind of transnational agreements are not something you could do over two weeks and completely understand that but uh, how best could we sync up what we've already been doing so if we had climate targets at the city state corporate region you know level how could we already integrate them and create a consortium that is more trackable right like how could we make a you know uh, kind of data backed almost like a stock market of emission reduction targets and progress. That way we could, the same way we would look at Dow, we could quantitatively know, are we headed the right direction? If so, in which sector, which time frame? You know, something like that would move the conversations a lot closer to where we want it to be versus just restarting. Hey, you know, 445 PPMs, you know, 1.5 degree pathway. It's like, we got that. Like, we've been talking about this, like, since I was in high school. 
why are we like why are we still talking about that like we we know i think everyone who needs to act they already know the underlying issues what they're not clear about is the incentives and the, you know is it a compliance driven thing if so what does that look like is that going to change the cost effective test for a lot of folks who are waiting to set or reduce emissions right those are the open questions that i think are important and while there has been you know some conversations on that i don't want to say nothing has happened there does need to be something that has more teeth if this is our manhattan project you know the urgency doesn't really feel as pressing i guess so i think it's a long way of answering your question of i think it's a mixed signal i think the conversations happening need to happen but we shouldn't shy away from more ambitious conversations more uh committed roadmaps than than we have as of today well speaking of ambitious conversations you've mentioned three different startups we kind of went over your bio what are some of the most valuable lessons you've learned about yourself on your journey um yeah that's a, that's a good one i think um i think one of the most valuable lessons have to be around which which aspects of your you know goals hypothesis you know ambitious ambitiousness or whatever it is for your venture and for yourself which one of them should be non-negotiable and which one of them which ones of ones need to be flexible I and mean, that's a, that's an understanding that you should happen on day that have on day 0 as an entrepreneur like i don't think there's any problem or any kind of solution to put out in the market that doesn't require you to really um go through a stressful kind of internal stage of kind of soul searching hey is this what i ultimately want this solution to do if you're faced with adversity which i guarantee you will um you know having that clear internal thesis of okay i just, i'm solving for this for this reason if you have if that is clear everything else falls uh in place fairly um fairly simply versus if you're you know trying to go after a big market uh there's so many things that will stand in the way and so many different versions of the same goal that it will be very exhausting for you but you know what's equally maybe damaging is it'll be confusing for your team and for your company so if you're the one who started this and like it or not you imprinted yourself on the company having that guiding star and being very clear about that guiding star helps that expectations reduce lack of cohesion among team members you know lets people who are coming in looking from the outside align more with your mission and really understand what the vision of what they're building is it isn't just you know software we're not using blockchain you know those things are helpful but that is just a means to an end what is the end don't build things for the sake of building things you have to build because that's you know in your opinion the only way of getting to that goal state and that goal state should be important enough at least to you that you know it's worth going through every um every no you know going through years of no traction or you know really taking a bet that's unpopular um uh, based on obviously metrics but also got feeling that you can stick with what you're doing for a lot longer than anyone else uh, in your sector or maybe arguably in the world so i think those are the things that really opened my eyes you know started scaling a company through the pandemic um was you know challenging but you would you you can live through some of those challenges if your guiding star is there if it isn't there then you just you know as a rational person you wouldn't push as hard uh on on certain things even though you might need to push fairly hard as an entrepreneur so i don't know if that's helpful but i think it all i'm saying is being clear and honest with yourself about what you're building why and how how far are you willing to take those are the things that you know for each venture like those are the unifying things that i get to learn about myself absolutely and speaking of goal state let's move into the future it's 2030 forbes is going to write another article about you specifically about dynamics what would you like that headline to read um yeah so that's i mean yeah obviously for dynamics and for the world at that point um net zero will be a thing you know like the goal of trying to get to net zero is a thing that we've accomplished it's a thing of the past it's like ozone right like we don't talk about it because we've actually kind of gotten to uh that that level as as a as a society so by 2030 i think they will write one paragraph about how we started when we started and why 
and then it'll talk about the services that we're providing then, which would be more around sustainable finance. You know, it will be more about actually making sure that the the pounds of emissions or pounds of any naturally degrading compound, whether it be pollutants, toxins, and you know anything emissions, is tied more to investments. So you know we are of the uh, looking forward into the future. We think the newer versions of ESG and green bonds. Um, climate notes, you know, we're going to have almost a payment processing level understanding of every negative impact that our economic activity has. So while we're starting with climate today, and in five years, we're going to solve it. In the 10-year mark, it, it's going to be a protocol level service, much like PayPal or Google AdWords that you don't really think about. You just consume knowing that the positive outcomes are are happening somewhere else. You're deriving environmental value from our services, much how you do economic value today from some of the big tech folks. That's a beautiful vision. I look forward to seeing it come to fruition. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> so last question, and you kind of tied this in already a little earlier when I asked you the question of what you've learned about yourself. If you could share some specific advice, words of wisdom with the audience, it could be for entrepreneurs, it could be for personal, professional, what would it be? Yeah, so I mean, for entrepreneurs, you know, I would have um, I, the one thing I would, you know, want people to take away is that, you know, the 30 under 30 stuff or kind of overall like youth level stuff, don't let that, don't let that create this urgency of you have to pick what you want to do for the next 10 years before the end of the month. That creates an external pressure that I, I don't feel like needs to be there. Um, I think, you know, take your time really understanding what you're good at obviously and what you want to do but like what value do you do you kind of take pride in 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 doing like i could do you know as ceo obviously as an early company you have to do a lot of things there are certain things i enjoy there are certain things i don't enjoy but then there are certain things that i look back and i value figure out what that aspect is it could be thematic it could be good at product dev it could be kind of a functional area Right, it could it, it could be uh, uh, industry space. Hey, I'm pretty good at buying low, selling high. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's what I'm good at. That's what I enjoy. So, going through that process early on, either as, as an entrepreneur or as a professional overall, take your time in understanding that, and you know, don't let kind of arbitrary requirements stress you out that you're not where you want to be, and you know, don't think that it is that one thing that you're good at. And, you know, you're going to ignore everything else. Sometimes you're good at two, three things that have nothing to do with each other. But if early on you say no to path two and three, you kind of kind of miss out the future that could have been if you kept those other things that you enjoy as part of your toolkit. Um, and the last thing I think maybe not so popular is, you know, I think everyone wants to be good at a lot of things. And I think that's kind of almost the human psychology that I want to be good at four or five different skill sets because they're all equally good. And I think that makes sense and that's, there's some merit. But find what you're really, really good at and be even better at that one thing. Because, um, you know, at the end of the day, you, you have, you know, mathematically have two choices. You could be a generalist at a few things or a specialist at, at, at one thing. Um, so what it might seem antithetical to what I said earlier, picking two, three things that you're really good at you know it, you believe it, you've tested yourself out in very high stress situations, highly dynamic environments, and try to hone in skills for those specific things um, because, you know, that that is the contribution that others in society need. So you need, people need somebody who could really do a couple things really well that hundreds of people that could do a hundred things sort of well because there's no differentiation between hundred people trying to do those hundred things. So for a professional and for an entrepreneur, kind of being honest about what role you play, what role you like to play, and what role has the most value. Take your time and really understanding how those things come together, and and don't be don't don't be under a time crunch or some sort of arbitrary requirement to just pick one and then commit to ten years of of doing that. Because oftentimes it's not the uh, you don't have all the information yet to make that kind of a long term stance on something. I love the idea of not letting arbitrary requirements stress you out. Sunny, I really appreciate your time today, and I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Absolutely, Raj. Uh, anytime. Thanks again for having me. This was, this was great.
Thank you, Sunny. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. And you can show your support by sharing our show with a friend or reach out to us on social media where you'll find us under our Nexus PMG handle. If there's a subject or topic you'd like to hear about, send me an email, btu at nexuspmg.com or contact me via our website, nexuspmg.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter where we share what we're reading and thinking about in the clean tech, green tech sectors. Bigger Than Us is a Nexus PMG production.